Need a sealant to help shield your home from the elements? Introducing Tight Shield, your weatherproof shield against the elements. One of Tight Bond's newest sealant products, Tight Shield fills gaps up to two inches while remaining flexible. It adheres to almost any material and expands and contracts up to 50% of joint size. Plus, it comes in a variety of colors and is paintable. Check out Tight Shield and the rest of Tight Bond's sealant line at tightbond.com. But haven't we decided that uh, like setbacks on thermostats are really not helpful in that regard? I mean, that's not an easy answer, right? The vast majority of existing houses that aren't low load houses and that don't have optimized equipment, setbacks work. And setting your and setting your system back when you're not going to be home around or around or whatever uh, can work. And the smart thermostats can help with that. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey, everyone. Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hey there. And our amazing producer, Andres Semeniego. Hello. Please email your questions to FHB Podcast at finehomebuilding.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, guys, I think we're off to a great start already. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. And we're all here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mike, it's good to have you on the show. How you been? Oh, I talked to you last week, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah, everything's good. <laughs> It's, what are you working on? Oh, I, you might remember uh, last, I don't know if I told you on the podcast, last year during one of the podcast recordings, I had in the morning before we recorded, I had a tree cutter coming and trimming like 30 trees, cutting them out of my mother's property and my property around our homes. And then I came to do the podcast and then I went back out after the podcast and they I had marked the trees with, you know, uh, surveyor's tape, wrapped it around the trunks, and they cut, instead of cutting like 10 trees in an area, they cut 20 trees. They cut trees I did not want cut. Wow. So, what do you do? Exactly. What do you do? <laughs> it's kind of too late at that point. He offered not to charge me for cutting those trees down. But so now it's a good time to plant. So I'm transplanting some uh, eastern Atlantic red cedar trees from uh, another property I have down the road that are about, you know, five, six feet tall. And I'm, I'm digging holes and planting those in the root strewn area of where mm. the trees were cut out. And you know, when you get those roots all knitted together from, you know, trees that are 40, 50 years old, just getting through to some soil beneath is just a challenge. Fortunately, a back so hole. is it an axe or a mattock you use? What's your preferred tool for digging a hole in a root-strewn soil? Well, I did what I could with the backhoe and kind of ripped out some some of the stumps, but some of them are just too big for my machine. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, well, first it's picking the spot and going between the big roots that are there. And then I have a, a pickaxe, a uh, grub hoe, and a shovel, and then a uh, old, um, like a, an axe, an regular axe for splitting wood that I'm just uh, sacrificing to the cause of chopping through those uh, remaining roots that I need to get out of the way. Well, it's going to save you a gym membership, that is for sure, <laughs> because I am sure that is back breaking. Yep. It is. Do you enjoy that work? I know you like to work hard. I, I'm guessing it's something you don't have to think much about and you just go to yeah, it. Yeah, I do. I do like it. It's just frustrating to have to do something that didn't need to be done. Always. How about you, Brian? Do you feel like you're doing something that shouldn't have to be done? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I, I got something uh, done or mostly done this weekend that needed to be done for a long time, which was to finish the um, built-in at our, at, at our entryway in our house. Um, I had, you know, we, we have... I'm a big fan. I've probably shared this before, but I'm a big fan of like a mud rooms in houses or some sort of like, you know, some sort of real utility space at your, your daily entry. Um, I just think that, that it's, you know, it's, it's 
a worthwhile space to have because of all the stuff we come and go with. And, you know, we're a shoes off house, so you need a place to put your shoes at the door and all that kind of stuff. So, but our house is, you know, relatively tight and we didn't actually have, um, you know, we didn't have the space to have a, a, a full mud room. So what I did was I made sure that by the entry, there was space for what is essentially, you know, the kind of built in you would see in a mud room. Um, and, and when, when I was, when I was finishing up the house or, 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 you know, when I was trying to get us into the house and I was building the kitchen cabinets, it was, uh, I had all the materials that I needed to build the bench. So the bottom part of the built in. So I got that done. I built the, I built a bench and that's been there for the last uh, year and a half that we've been in the house. And I finally got around this past weekend to building the upper portion of it. And it's, uh, you know, nothing um, that people aren't used to seeing in, in mud rooms. It's basically a bench with some vertical cubbies that go up on, on either side of the bench and then a uh, shelf across the top. And, um, and, you know, and so anyway, I had, I had been, been putting that off for a long time. I finally went out a few weeks ago and bought a few sheets of plywood to get, get to some of the last built in things and shelves that I needed to outfit in the house. And, and that was my weekend project, which was a, which was kind of a fun one to do. So now only thing, cool. the only thing I have left to do is put some, some hooks up and, uh, and do the little bit of painting that it needs. Can I ask you about hooks? This might seem like a silly thing to folks listening, but uh, I find the quality of the kind of stuff you get at the home center now or hardware store is complete garbage. Like the screws break and strip out and I've had the hooks actually break off in what I would describe as reasonable loads. Uh, are you buying something special? <laughs> Have you thought about that? Um, well, I, it's, a, it's a great question, Patrick. I haven't thought about it. Um, what always frust frustrates me about hooks and other type of hardware is how challenging it can be to actually put the screws in with a driver, right? The driver seems, the hook seems to obscure the driver. So I, I realize that what, what you really need to do is drive, a, you know, is just do a little pilot hole and put them in with a screwdriver instead of, because, you know, I end up messing up the hook or, or the screw, you know, the finish of it with my driver. Um, but I actually have some hooks um, that Sam forged. Um, my son, Sam forged when he was about 12 years old. He was, he was working at the time in a blacksmith shop um, and he, he forged all these hooks with so his sort of learning um, experience in the blacksmith shop and, and at the forge was to make these hooks. He just had to, the, the blacksmith had him make them over and over and over again as like, he, he would, it would sort of be his uh, warm up when he got there. And in, in a way that he developed his skills is that he would just, he'd go in and he'd do a dozen hooks first thing when he got there. And then she would teach him some new skills um, mm -hmm. after he did a, after he did a certain number of hooks every time. And I've kept a, a a bunch of those, and actually, like I had them in, I've had them installed in three different places now, and I just keep removing them when I leave because they're, you know, they're sent, they have sentimental value, and so I'm going to put those up in the uh, as the hooks. And those are Fantastic. these, the, yeah. they're yeah, they're bulletproof. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> some of them are a little sharp. He wasn't that refined as a blacksmith at the time, but uh, but they're bulletproof. So one thing I learned from my uh, peers at Fine Woodworking was that you first put a, a steel screw, a genuine like old school uh, Phillips wood screw uh, in first and then use the finished screws, which, a good idea, you yeah. know, in, in their world are often brass and super easy to destroy. So. Yes. Seemed like a good tip. Uh, Mike, any suggestions for uh, uh, dealing with like hooks and hardware? Do you, where do you buy good stuff that's not an arm and a leg? You know, I was thinking as Brian was talking uh, about the hardware I've used over the years, and often they're salvaged pieces of hardware from homes that I've deconstructed, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years ago. And I just have these bins in my uh, storage building full of old, old hardware, even though it has lots of coats of paint on it. I'll take that to, a, you know, a, a rotary a wire brush and I'll just brush them down, and usually it's you know brass or or some other nice metal underneath, and polish them up, give them a clear coat, and repurpose them. And they're not as prone to breaking as you were pointing out, Patrick. A lot of the the cast uh, hardware we get today is very brittle and can snap off with very uh, light light loads. You heard it, folks. Uh, if you need old hardware that stands up to the test of time, uh, reach out to Mike and he'll, he'll hook you up. <laughs> 
Andres, uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, you've been traveling. Were you doing building or home uh, projects somewhere else by chance? <laughs> I have not, but I was really tempted to get some type of, of land in, in Peru where I was traveling and build some type of A-frame for like a getaway. It seems like a, such a great idea where there is surrounded by mountains and it's just beautiful landscapes. Well, sign me up to help build it because I, I would totally do that. I bet Brian would take a week or two to Definitely. help with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, uh, I want to remind you about uh, our Keep Craft Alive uh, department and initiative and uh, suggestions for Keep Craft Alive folks who uh, epitomize that spirit. And I hope you'll write in with your suggestions so we can include them. And as Brian pointed out last time, uh, especially folks who we don't know about, learning about them is really an awesome thing with, to do with uh, Keep Craft Alive. So if you could keep that in mind, I'd be grateful. I also want to remind you about the uh, upcoming BS and Beer Symposiums uh, for, in Boston and Chicago. Uh, Boston's is in, in September, and we've been criticized for alerting folks to these kind of things far too late. So we're trying to do a better job. Uh, and in Chicago, which is uh, October 8th and 9th, and uh, I want to point out that uh, Keep Craft Alive benefits from your attendance fees, and uh, we're going to be more involved in those shows, so I can't wait to see you. So I hope you'll go. Any thoughts, Brian? Yeah, I, I, uh, my thoughts are that these are, these are pretty excellent events, um, and um, I, you know, Travis and Joe, who started these events, Travis and Joe Cook started them sort of as an extension of BS and Beer. Um, their their local BS and Beer group, you know, they've they've really done a, a excellent job of keeping the programming top notch, getting you know some some really some of the you know the the best uh, presenters that they can um, for each event. And then yeah, it's 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 philanthropic. You know, they're they're you know most of the most of the proceeds you know end up funding a scholarship, which is awesome. And um, and I'm gonna go to the Chicago event. So if uh, if you decide to if you decide to you know to go to the Chicago event, please you know find me and, and say hi. Let's connect. Andres, you've been, and uh, what did you think? I've been to the one in Stratford, which was which was the the one local to us, and it's pretty great. I actually learned a lot from Ben Bogie at the time. I'm still basic. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't recall who else was there, but. Everybody was talking, you know, building science and, and a lot of people asked questions and there was there like to learn, which, which was, you know, great to connect with people, you know. Mike, have you been to one of these? Yeah, I was at the uh, first one that you went to, which was the second one that Travis and Joe put together in um, out in Kansas City, I believe. And uh, yeah, I presented at one. I haven't been to others. I've been invited to go, but haven't. What what strikes me about them is the uh, the... Uh, folks that attend, it's such a wide range of folks, some who are very, very experienced and knowledgeable about building science and building, and some that are not. And just the exchanges between the uh, folks in the audience at the breaks or at the uh, you know, at lunch or at dinner um, are, are, are encouraging to see, you know, people helping people. I think Andres really touched on something that has struck me is the... Um engagement and uh, savviness of the folks who attend often in many cases asking amazing questions as Andres was uh, pointing out and boy that is a great way to learn from others and their questions I think. Speaking of questions uh, we're going to get to those in a little bit here but uh, we heard from our uh, several listeners and thanks you all for writing in. This comes from Scott in southwest Ohio Hey podcast after building our house I wanted to add outdoor lighting and researched uh, having it done or doing it myself. I had quotes of five to $10,000 from companies, which seemed like a lot. As luck would have it, I found a Better Homes and Gardens LED kit at Walmart. The kit came with a transformer, five pathway lights, a couple of spotlights. After some simple math, I determined that the transformer had excess capacity and I purchased some extra spotlights, a cable splitter, and longer length cables. For under $150, plus not a lot of my time, I had a great solution we are seven plus years later now, and over that time, I had a transformer fail, and I purchased a spare along with some spare lights. I've had a few lights fail, and the finish is fading, but the system works just fine. If I could go back in time, I would have purchased two or three of these kits and had a lifetime supply of components. 
Every year I look at Walmart and they have not sold another kit or anything like it since. I enjoy the podcast, Scott, in Southwest Ohio. Well, thanks, Scott. Um, that's interesting. I, I uh, would have bought a few of those myself uh, had I been back in time with you there. What do you guys think? Can you get good stuff at Walmart sometimes? I haven't tried. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't tried the building products. You know, I've gone in there, of course, uh, often while traveling and because um, you can get anything there. And I, you know, of course, browse the tool aisle and uh, it seems like it's a bunch of junk. Uh, so I haven't been tempted there. But uh, yeah, I think the outdoor lights, I'm guessing it's the same stuff you buy on Amazon or other uh, large retailers in many cases. What do you think, Brian? You gonna Are you tempted? Well, I definitely, I definitely am uh, get, getting closer to doing a low voltage landscape lighting project of my own. So the more, the more tips like this I get, the better. Um, and I'm also, I know that we're going to have, we're going to cover this topic. It might not be for a little while, but we have our lighting expert David Warfel on a couple of uh, product articles, uh, and this is the second one he's going to do. So first he's going to do. Um, different types of down lighting for interior use. And then he's going to do low voltage uh, landscape lighting solutions. So I don't know if I can hold out that long, but um, <laughs> you know, I, have, I have an inside source. So I'll definitely be asking him for his recommendations. Um, on another note about Walmart, we are publishing in our next issue, a story on smart thermostats or connected thermostats or whatever the, the right term is, depending on which, which actually which thermostat it is. Uh, but one of the recommendations in there, and it, it's, you know, the, the editors over at uh, PC Magazine recommend the WISE, W-Y-Z-E thermostat, which is sort I think is, um, I don't know if it's, I don't know exactly what the affiliation with Walmart is, but I think that's Walmart's sort of home solutions um, line, or maybe they have, they have some partnership with them, but you can get it at Walmart for like 60 something dollars. Um, and Amazing. It's known to be a really great thermostat. Wow. My local utility has been, um, I don't, I guess they must buy in bulk the uh, connected thermostats and I can get them for like, uh, like a, a Nest or a Sensi from Emerson for like $15. And it's wow. just, yeah, it, it's like they, they're, they're encouraging a lot of people. What's their incentive? Why? Because we like, I believe, you in Connecticut and Massachusetts are decoupled energy systems. So the uh, energy company that delivers your power does not produce your power. So they're incentivized to make things more energy efficient um, through state mandates and oversight regulations. So they want to reduce the use of power as opposed to what yeah. most utilities like to do. Right. But haven't we decided that uh, like setbacks on thermostats are really not helpful in that regard? I mean, well, that's a that's that there's some of that discussion in the in the article, Patrick, and that is a nuance. That's not an easy answer. Right. There are in in the houses that we that we talk about, um, you know, in low load houses and energy efficient houses where you have and with and specifically with heat pumps that are right sized or or heating and cooling equipment that is right sized. You know, it doesn't. It, setbacks are not the way to go, right? The way to go is to set your thermostat to a comfortable temperature and leave it there. Um, but in 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 the vast majority of existing houses that aren't low load houses and that don't have optimized equipment, setbacks work. And setting mm -hmm. your and setting your system back when you're not going to be home around or around or whatever uh, can work. And the smart thermostats can help with that by um, by not only like. Um, you know, using the, the ones that have the learning aptitude and can predict your behaviors, um, you know, can can help with that. Uh, but they even, you know, they even do things like predict the time that it actually takes the house to, to get to the comfortable temperature. So they're not only setting it back, but they're timing uh, the set point with your arrival. So they're they're pretty remarkable in that way. And I think that discussion of setbacks versus not setbacks really depends on the house and the equipment that you have in the house. Well, I can't wait to uh, learn more about that, Brian, because I think you probably would recognize uh, I am skeptical of the whole, uh, you know, connected home uh, uh, architecture. And, uh, you know, if there are good reasons to adopt things. I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Mike, we, were you just so that for clarification for the listeners, when I mentioned Way Wise and Walmart, you were you shaking your head about the is there not a connection between the two of them? Uh, might, is it just that it's available there? Yeah, I think it's just available there because I I have some of the wise components there. They have different um, 
like a, a plug-in cube that you can access through your phone, long distance Wi-Fi. So I can like turn lights on and off at either of my houses when I'm at the other house. And they have the same thing for switches and some other uh, products. Um, so, I, okay. and, and I bought those uh, at a variety of online and uh, big box stores. So I don't think there's a okay. direct connection with uh, Walmart, but they're probably available there. Yeah, and I know that they're available there. And for some reason, I had thought that there was more of a connection than that. But I might be, I might be wrong about that. It might just be that it's a, it's a that PC Magazine is saying it's a good product that you can get at at a big box store. Mm. Uh, this next one comes from Justin in Northeast PA. You all may remember that Justin had a port ceiling uh, that was less ceiling, more like vented soffit. He says, uh, "Howdy, podcast and the gang. I have an up." on you and my patio ceiling slash bedroom floor project from episode 599. You may remember I had a patio ceiling made from vented soffits that was leaking air into a portion of the bedroom floor above. I wanted to make it through most of the winter before discussing the success of my repair. I took your advice into consideration but still went with the overkill method of insulating air ceiling. Despite this, I really appreciate all your tips and reassurance I would have never come up with my plan if I didn't listen to 600 and some episodes of the Fine Home Building podcast. As you can see in the pictures of my first layer under the framing was screwed up and glued zip sheathing. I considered butting the foam up against the framing with cap nails and then screwing the sheathing underneath, but I noticed that the sheathing right against the framing made the assembly feel much more secure. Then came the overkill with two additional inches of XPS. I screwed in another layer of OSB with long fasteners to reach through the XPS to the zip. I did this to have something to nail the tongue and groove ceiling to. Again, it's overkill, but I wanted to have some fun in the process. Lastly comes the pine tongue and groove board stained in Danish oil nailed to the OSB above. I added flush mounted ceiling lights, a motion sensor lights, and even a new outlet for some string lights that was easily accessible since the bedroom was stripped down to the studs. The rigid foam and sheathing layers were air sealed with 3M all weather flashing tape. And I even applied from above to the zip sheathing to waste time and money. <laughs> Mineral wool baths were thrown in the floor joists. As the winter is coming to a close, I definitely noticed a difference in not only the temperature of the house, but sound transmission as well. The rumbling of cars driving by was minimized almost completely. I really have enjoyed all the air sealing and insulating adventures that I've gone through over the years and notice a very significant difference of comfort and my heating bill since the upgrades. However, as others have mentioned on the podcast, if you live in an old house with literal no insulation in the wall cavities, there's only so much you can do. Uh, he says a couple tips for others who might be listening uh, to hold up the layers of sheathing and insulation. I used cheap $50 a pair extendable lifts. Uh, he calls them cabinet jacks. I'm not sure what to call them, but I included a link below to a similar product you can get on Amazon. Uh, I, I call them support poles, like folks who are familiar with uh, zip uh, enclosures that hold up poly sheathing are familiar with a similar type telescopic pole. Uh, he says, I placed uh, painter's tape over the locations of the framing so I could see where to put the fasteners. Uh, finally, he says, thanks as always for the work you do. My house would be freezing without all of you. <laughs> Uh, that's great. I'm, I'm uh, pleased to hear from you, uh, Justin, and I think you did a fantastic job. What do you guys think? It looks well, so it looks much really better nice. than that vinyl. Yeah. yeah, boy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, and if it, if it made the house more comfortable and efficient, that's awesome. He did. He did good work. Agreed. Yeah. Justin also wanted to remind me that there is no apostrophe s in physician's assistant, <laughs> so it's physician assistant, not physician's assistant. Did you know that, Brian? No. I didn't either. The things you learn on the FHB copy editors, podcast. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this comes, comes from Stephen, who wrote uh, a question uh, to episode 626 discussing his intention to uh, build in Cochise County, Arizona. Uh, I was listening to podcast 626 discussing my Cochise County opt-out question. I just wanted to follow up with some information that might help someone else. Number one, land is zoned RU4 and must be a minimum of four acres. It costs between two to six thousands for four rural acres. Every year, Cochise County sells OTC land between January and March with a starting offer of $2,000. Do you guys know what OTC is? I looked at it and I wasn't exactly sure, but it just seems like they just sell it at, at a 
you know, you, you make an offer and, and they either accept it or don't. Maybe Steve will write in with further clarification about that. Um, he says, uh, start, the parcels are st starting, they sell OTC land between January and March with a starting offer of $2,000. They're tax delinquent properties that didn't sell in August of the previous year. You get the land free and clear. If the land is subdivided, check the GIS, which is the Geographic Information System for surveys or the county office, and stay away from property with drainage easements. Uh, two, septic. Septic permits are required and a PERC test is required. Um, water, if your land is not in the Douglas Active Management Area, you can drill your own well after submitting an intent to drill. The parcel must be less than five acres. It can only be residential use and the well cannot be more than 32 gallons per minute. Uh, inside uh, an Active Management Area, you need a driller's license. Uh, Well55.com will show you the Arizona well depths and uh, to get an idea of the local water table. Uh, buildings you can build out of any material, such as hay or adobe, as long as you follow the 2019 IRC. Smoke alarms are, smoke alarms are required. If you have water, power, and septic to a residential build site, you can get a temporary occupancy permit to live in the finished portion of the house or get a temporary six-month RV permit to live in an RV during construction. I got to tell you guys, I am tempted to do this <laughs> upon Steve's, uh, yeah. I'm thinking Steve might be a booster for Cochise County, Arizona. And if you are, Steve, I forgive you because you sucked me in. Uh, what do you think about this, Mike? You know more about this than any of us. Well, I think you should visit Cochise County. You, you probably find <laughs> you, you, there, it, there's some dramatic areas. And then there's some, um, what you might think of, it, it kind of look in the middle part of it. It's kind of in a, a I don't know what to call it, valley, I guess. Um, it's, it's kind of like prairie, like with mountains in the distance. So yeah, it's a nice place to be in good weather. I couldn't believe the price of the land. <laughs> That's bonkers. Yeah. I didn't, I've I mean, never seen it that cheap, even in other areas. There's going to be a land rush on Cochise County and no one's going to know why. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this comes from Michael in Minnesota. Hey, folks, regarding the $300,000 small houses mentioned in podcast 625, we built a 600-square-foot ADU as part of a garage rebuild in southwest Minneapolis. People often ask what the construction cost was, expecting it to be low. I remind them that a small dwelling has all of the expensive rooms, kitchen, bathroom, mechanical, and a few of the cheaper rooms, bedrooms uh, with some sheetrock and a ceiling fixture. The per foot square foot cost of our ADU was well above similar quality construction. Uh, so new construction, I'm sure he means. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised because it, the economies of scale with modern houses are why they're two to 4,000 square feet in most cases. Thoughts, anyone? He's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's no doubt. <laughs> Yeah, this comes from Sean in Driggs, Idaho. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Driggs, Idaho is the um, border of uh, Wyoming with the Grand Tetons. And forgive me, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, right? It's in that area. Um, Sean writes, hey, all, I'm currently working my way through the early years of the podcast. And the whole team seems to agree that dense pack cellulose is the way to go for insulating wall assemblies. I've looked on the Fine Home Building online resource and see the videos on the process as well. It seems like a great option, but one that requires an insulation crew and is not DIY friendly. As an owner builder about to break ground on a new build, my current plan is to use mineral wool bats in the two by six wall cavities. What most would all agree is a DIY friendly approach in combination with zip R6 and a smart vapor membrane. Uh, we're in climate zone six. Knowing that the crew on the podcast is very hands-on and DIY, I'm curious to know if dense packing cellulose is possible as a DIYer or if it truly does require the expertise and equipment from a professional installation. It, seem, it doesn't seem complicated, but perhaps I'm missing something, or perhaps the blowing equipment is the detail preventing homeowners from trying this at home. Thanks for the podcast. Uh, 
we should first say that dense pack cellulose uh, is uh, either installed in a six sided cavity or you need to make some kind of provisions to uh, keep it contained uh, while you install it. Uh, and that's key to the whole thing. So, uh, Brian, do you want to first address like, do you think this is a DIY possible uh, option? Um, I've never tried it. So I can't, you know, personally can't speak to that. I believe that we've published some articles uh, or, you know, commentaries kind of on GBA from people who have done their own dense packing with rental machines. Um, so I don't, um, and, you know, I tend to, I tend to trust the GBA crowd, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's, you know, that it's an easy thing to do. I mean, I blowing insulation, you know, into an attic for loose fill is very user friendly DIY kind of thing. But um, dense packing is, I, th I think, you know, sort of a different, I think it's, you know, different animal than that. So, you know, I think it, 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 it would depend on how willing, you know, they are to, to do the research and to be patient um, when they when they get started, if they if they want to try it. Um, but, you know, keep in mind that the, the rental machines are different machines than what the professionals have in their trucks. So you're you're not using a machine that's meant for dense packing if you get a rental machine. Um, but that's about, that's about all I can offer on this one. Cause I haven't, I haven't tried it myself or even been on a job site where someone was trying a, a DIY dense pack. I've done a number of them DIY, um, after watching a crew screw up a new home construction job that I was building, they were doing dense pack. The, most companies are used to doing dense pack, uh, in my area on existing homes. So they got that six sided cavity closed in by the wall sheathing on the outside, the studs, plates, and then the drywall or plaster on the inside. But in new construction, we have to put either a netting or a, 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 a reinforced plastic on the face of the studs. And that's where they had a problem because um, they didn't understand that the way it works. Anyway, I ended up doing it myself, got a little instruction from somebody, and it's very easy to do, but Brian's point of having the right equipment is the key. If you go into a big box store and purchase your cellulose and they usually have a loaner uh, blower, those blowers are good for addicts and they're just not powerful enough to get your density up above about three pounds per cubic foot. And you want to have your dense pack at about a 3.5 to four pound per cubic foot density. If there's an insulation supplier, a company that doesn't generally sell to the, the the public, they're mostly selling to insulation contractors. They may have a loaner or rental uh, professional level uh, cellulose blowers. And in that case, if you can find a company like that, then you could do it yourself. And the learning curve is very short. I mean, it's like after like two bays, I knew doing a bag count, um, how to get it to, to, to dense pack without um, the machine clogging up or the hose clogging up and you, you, I picked it up pretty quickly. So I think anybody could, it's not that hard, but getting the equipment is the key. Uh, Andres, uh, are you familiar with dense packing and have you, would you consider it as a, a personal, uh, way to insulate? I had considered it because I was, you know, planning on insulating my, my garage. And that was one of the options that I was exploring and I was, you know, really, researching this topic and I saw uh, some people do it, but, uh, now that I hear <laughs> Mike, um, you know, and the way to do it, you know, I might, I might consider it for, for my garage and possibly even my, my attic to do some air sealing on top of, of, uh, dense packing. So, uh, I had a chance to see someone who does this professionally, uh, John Riley, and I'll put a link on the podcast page to this, uh, feature article titled dense pack cellulose insulation done right. And uh, a couple things about uh, what M Mike and Brian and Andres said is that uh, the machine is the key to this, right? You need an insulation blower that can generate a lot of pressure to sufficiently jam it in the cavities. And I will also say it takes an incredibly long time. Uh, you know, insulating is often the fastest part of a new home build or a big remodel, right? Putting in bats doesn't take long. Spray foam doesn't take long. Uh, this takes a long time. So, you know between having to get the equipment and uh, spending the time to do it, I think it is better left to a pro. But 
I would never discourage anyone from trying it because I think it is entirely possible you could do it, but be prepared to invest some time. And uh, probably uh, you're going to have to buy a, a, an upholstery stapler to secure the netting if you're doing it in a new build, as Mike suggests. And one of the things you can do to mess it up is not put enough staples in. And then, as Mike pointed out, the netting uh, comes un, uh, unfastened while you're trying to dense pack, and then you have a big mess to clean up, and then you have to do it again. I think yeah, since, I have seen. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Mike. I think since Sean's doing a new build, that dense packing the exterior walls, you're probably not going to get much advantage out of doing that. It, it, where you really get the advantage of dense packing is in older walls, where when you dense pack in the cellulose, you're going to reduce some of the air leakage through that wall due to the density of the cellulose. If it's a new build, you probably already have your control layer for air uh, control figured out exterior sheathing or drywall, whatever it happens to be, then bad insulation is probably going to work just fine. People like the uh, carbon sequestering aspect of insulation, uh, cellulose insulation, Mike. So I think that is one reason folks would give you for wanting to, to do this versus some other insulation product. And you can jump to Timber HP and get the bats for, the, for that and then. Boy, that is the appealing part of that it? to me, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Uh, forgive me. This comes from Brian in uh, Oneonta, New York. Hey, podcast team. I've got an 1850s farmhouse with major settling. This particular door has a massive gap at the top. What do you think is the best fix? <laughs> <laughs> you want to describe it, Patrick? What, do, what we're looking at in the photo? I think massive gap is uh, a fairer description. Uh, uh, it goes from zero to probably, I don't know, an inch, seven eighths of an inch uh, at the other side. It looks like it's maybe a 30 inch door. So, Am I wrong that, to think that we, we discussed a door similar to this not long ago? So that was an exterior door. Now we're doing the uh, interior. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Brian? How would you fix this? Well, I, I mean, first you have, you have to determine what's, you know, what's happening. Um, and so I, you know, I, that, which could be, which could be the hinges pulling away from the jam. It could be the jam moving. It could be, you know, it could kind of be any, any number of things here. Right. I want to say something. <laughs> my, my, my favorite a part about this question is there are so many ways to fix this. Oh, right. There are hundreds of ways to theoretically fix this. Um, I, I think it depends entirely on one's uh, tolerance for hackery uh, uh, or you could do nothing because this is an old house. This is kind of a thing you might expect in a house from 1850. What do you think, Mike? What would, Mike, what would you do? Well, first I'd analyze the problem. He says that there's major settling. Now, does that mean major settling occurred in 1875 or did major settling occur <laughs> in, you know, in 2022? Um, and then, because that has implications for how you go about fixing this. If it's a recent settling problem, fix the problem with the settling first before you deal with the door. If it's from the 1870s, then, and it hasn't moved in, you know, over a hundred years, then you can probably just, you know, like trim and rehang the door. I'm noticing though in the photograph that the miter joints on the fairly wide casing trim, they are perfectly tight. Yeah. Which, which tells me that either somebody recased this in past history or that maybe it was hung crooked to begin with and the door never fit the opening. Um, there's, there's, you know, it, it, that, that's why until you really dig into what's going on, it's hard to know, um, what, where to, how to approach it uh, and, and make sure that it lasts a long time into the future. Yeah. The, Andres, uh, what do you think? I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you, Brian, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, Andres, would you fix this? What, what would you do? I'll sell the house. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Brian? What are you going to do about this? Well, I, I still, I, I don't know because I don't, you know, it's hard to sit, it's hard to understand what's, what exactly is happening here. That's a big gap. And so if this door is not, uh, is this, if there, this door is still operating, 
that that means that the the that that fl- you know the floor must be way out of out of level or the or the door whatever's underneath this door you know must be way out of level to allow this door to still be swinging so i i really it's it's just really hard to say without without knowing exactly what is causing this problem interestingly the on the on the strike side if i'm not mistaken i mean it's only so much you can see in these photos of course but on the strike side it looks like the style is parallel with the, which is was very parallel with the door jam, so which means that that which makes it really hard for me to tell what's out what's <laughs> out, what's out of square here and what's not you know what's not plumb, but um, which, which would which would mean that if that if the store was really sagging the way it looks like at the top that 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 the the door jam is actually not plumb on the strike side either it's actually it's more parallel with the door but again these photos you know one photo of a door can be can be really deceiving. Um, so I never even thought about Mike's suggestion, which is to take it off the hinges, trim the top to fit, and then you might have a big gap at the bottom, but maybe not. So that's a, I think that's a really clever solution. My uh, very half-baked solution was to extend the um, styles and widen the rail uh, with uh, dutched in uh, pieces of stock, sanded, uh, bonded, whatever. And uh, I think you could spend easily a day or two futzing around with this door. Uh, the hackiest solution I had was just ignoring the styles and just adding a wedge to the, the top that you could even screw into the top of the door if you wanted to be really <laughs> dirty about it. But Well, it's also, let's let's not forget that this is one interior door that wouldn't be, it's not a giant project to just re, to just, you know, uninstall and reinstall this door. You mean the whole well, jam I mean, and casing and the whole nine yards, or just the, the a, panel yeah, itself? It's not a, no, the the you know to to actually well, I would first take the if you know if you would first take the door off the hinges and see if there's an easier solution. But you know to just to pop the trim off this door hmm. and to you know reset the jams would not be a, a this is what it's like. I said it's one interior door. Well, Brian and on- Onianta, uh, Brian Pontalillo is your new friend. He's going to come <laughs> over and we're going to rehang this door some Saturday morning. <laughs> have some cinnamon rolls for him. It'll be it'll be fun. I'm tempted to do nothing, but you know, Brian's looking for a project. I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> Would you fix this, Mike? If this was your old house, it depends on what that door is too if it's between like a dining room and a living room or you know two non-private rooms i would just leave it the way it is and in fact there are a lot of old homes not far from where i live in old colonial towns seaside that are uh you pay extra for the getting an old <laughs> house with character like this you know out of level floors totally agree. you know crooked windows and doors you know that that that's what the real estate agents sell you on is that history. Um, but if it was for a privacy room, like to a bedroom or a bathroom, then yeah, I think your suggestions, Brian, of, excuse me, uh, Patrick, of just putting a little, a little one by two up there at the top, up at the head of the door frame, <laughs> and then just call it done. That's a good, simple, easy to do solution or just yeah, pop it off the hinges, trim the top, lift it up, have a little gap at the bottom, put a, you know, a, a, an extra extension on the bottom style. There's lots of ways to play with that. That's what I said. Is it's yeah, there's a, a, an option for every personality type. No matter how fussy you are, you can fix this door uh, to your liking. I'm sure. I don't understand how that door is operating. <laughs> that's a that's a that's a big gap. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Do you think Brian's just trying to to test us with a photoshopped door? <laughs> I don't know. We need a video, right? We need video uh, documentation. It would be nice to see the uh, other side so we could see what the margin is around at both at the bottom mm-hmm. and then what the margins are on the left hinge side and the strike side, just out of curiosity, if nothing else. One of the problems, too, with photographs, depending on how you take them, the parallax, parallax of your camera kind yeah. of distorts uh, the uh, panels in the door. I was trying to figure out if the door itself had shifted We'll see that a lot in old panel doors where the strike side of the door, where the doorknob is, 
over the time will actually settle. It will slip down and you'll see it evidenced in the joints between the panels and the rails and the styles uh, with a paint gap. Uh, but I don't see that on that door panel. So that may not be a problem there. You, you're thinking that the, uh, the, you were describing a condition where the door had racked. Exactly. Uh, right. Uh, where, yep. yeah. The door racks itself. Door in, which case door? You put a, in which case you put a jack and you just jack the whole thing up <laughs> under the side. <laughs> that might work in this fence too, too, if you get, get a, a floor, flat bar. <laughs> floor jack and just jack up the, the door. Well, if you all have suggestions that we didn't come up with for uh, Brian's door, I hope you'll write in with them. Hair brain there's, ideas there's, or otherwise. Yeah. We'll accept everything. That's, so what I think about in rehanging a door is you go to the salvage yard maybe, and then you got a perfect template of your old door to uh, uh, recut a new one. You could do that too. Oh, man. Uh, this comes from Idle Mackey from Quebec. And the question was originally on GBA, but uh, I really wanted to feature it on the podcast because uh, stay tuned, y'all. I'm going to uh, reveal an amazing video done by the Cold Climate Research Lab uh, showing how to detail big penetrations in, in this case, double stud walls, but you could use it for just about any wall assembly, I would imagine. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But here first is the question. Hello, everyone. I've been lurking for a while here, and I thought and I've bought and read the Pretty Good House book. I finally jumped in and decided to go for a PGH in Quebec, Canada, Climate Zone 6. My general contractor and building team so far have been very interested in the build, and we managed to get someone skilled enough to blow cellulose in our double stud walls. Now everyone else, the plumber, ventilation guys, heat pump installers, have started poking holes everywhere. I've been looking for details about how to properly inspect and patch these holes in this type of construction without success. Does anyone have some details about the common holes and good practices? And uh, Ido Mackey or Ido Mackey uh, uh, identifies the penetrations that they're talking about. So far, uh, there's the intake and outtake of my HRV, the range hood uh, outlet, the plumbing vents, uh, the HVAC contractors holes to connect the exterior unit so they have a line set going through their wall, uh, electrical wiring for exterior lighting. Uh, I'm probably missing a few, but you get the idea. I intend to have a blower door test soon and would like to future-proof the openings since some contractors were not some, so familiar with double stud construction, although everyone has been really interested in the build and taking great care so far. Uh, I would first say that you're really lucky that the folks are uh, vested in this build because you can have people who don't care and boy, if they're interested and want to do a good job, you are nine-tenths of the way there. Did you guys happen to check out this video that I linked to in the in the uh, podcast notes? Brian, you're nodding. What do you think about this? Can you describe what they do? So it, it was it's I mean it's pretty straightforward, right? It is a a combination of expanding spray foam and an EP. I think it was EP and DM gasket, right? That that uh, the that the builder was using here. So um, the example of a you know of a larger kind of circular vent opening going through a wall. Um, using the expanding sealant to, you know, to fill that space between the, um, in in the in the penetration between the um, the vent and the sheathing, and then using the membrane to kind of tie it all together to tie the the vent to the to the interior surface of the sheathing, um, which is a, is something you can do, and I've seen done a lot with both, you know, sort of site made gaskets, but there's also lots of products that now that you can buy for different size things from from just you know uh, electrical cables going through a wall to you know big six inch um you know six inch round ducting going through through a wall what do you think mike i i liked the giant uh, eps block that they first <laughs> oh, yeah, put in the right. whole location that then then you can drill through and have a cylinder that you can air seal to which is i thought was brilliant you know i'm i'm wondering so first off if you making your exterior wall sheathing your air control layer, then you only have to make all of your air sealing at that plane. You don't have to uh, do anything in, in that foam block. I wasn't clear. So what the what they did was with this thick wall, they inserted just uh, maybe a two foot wide by stud bay width block of solid foam 
into the wall cavity where that penetration was going to take place. And then they drilled through it. But they seemed to make the implied that that was a good way to air seal to between whatever your penetration duct was and that foam block that you've now drilled out because it would be a solid material. But they didn't describe the fact that in order to make that process work, you're also going to have to air seal that block all around the perimeter on all six sides, or is it 12 sides? I don't know, all the surfaces around it. <laughs> um, so it seemed a little more complicated than just drill the hole in the wall, stick the piper wire out through the wall, and then either with the EPDM gasket or with caulking, seal or, fl or flexible flashing tape, whatever you want, pick, pick your product, and then seal the exterior wall sheathing to the pipe. Um, that seemed to me like something I do all the time, whether it's a double stud wall or a uh, regular single stud wall, and it, pretty effective. Um, so I, I, th I think the answer uh, to your question, Mike, is the where this these structures are located. Uh, so if you have a connection between the interior of your penetration and inside the stud cavity, right, the drywall is not going to be uh, perfectly sealed around your penetration. So uh, exfiltrating air is going to get into that entire stud cavity, potentially condense on the sheathing. So they want to have a way to prevent interior air from moving uh, toward the exterior and condensing someplace that could be damaging. So I think that's why I do it. And admittedly, it's probably extreme for most of the country. But when you're talking about, what is this, climate zone seven or eight, uh, Fairbanks, mm, Alaska, eight, where yeah. the climate... So, I mean, that, then this stuff starts to really matter. Yeah, I've, I've been that, to the I, Cold Climate Research Center a couple times a number of years ago, and, and they do do a lot of research on what they're talking about. So I'll give a nod to them that they mm -hmm. know what they're talking about for their climate zone, definitely. I kind of felt like the takeaway was that you could do it in either location um, with the combination of, of materials um, and because, you know, like – you know, Mike said, you're, you have to choose, you, you don't have to, you're likely choosing a place for your primary air barrier, whether it's on the inside or the outside. But I thought that the sort of the two, the belt and suspenders approach, both the sealant and the gasket was you, you could use that, whether you're doing it on the inside or doing it at the exterior, you could use a similar approach. And, you know, that's what, uh, you know, when I did all the air sealing on, on, uh, on our house, that's, that was kind of my approach everywhere. It was just like, it was a combination of products or a combination of, you know, two things, you know, that, that to make it work, you know, and it was often some stretch tape and some caulk or some foam, you know, on the inside and stretch tape on the outside, or just, you know, just kind of belt and suspenders that is both affordable and doesn't, and doesn't take very long. I, uh, I think it's a great question, uh, purely for the fact that, you know, the ERV, HRV ducts are way bigger than the stuff we've ordinarily been poking through uh, walls. And uh, I pres presume that the bigger the duct, the greater the potential for uh, leakage around it, right? Just by, uh, you know, square inches uh, as, a, as a measurement. It got me thinking, though, as they were putting those big ducts through is um, some manufacturers make the ducts out of foam, insulating foam, mm -hmm. so that you're not going to get the thermal conductivity when you are bridging through that deep wall cavity. Others that are made out of metal, they're going to transfer heat. So even though you've got a really well insulated wall and everything, all of a sudden you might notice if you're in a really cold climate in the middle of winter, that you're getting frost on the inside of your house along the perimeter of the collar of that uh, uninsulated steel pipe that's going through the wall cavity. So it's something to think about the thermal bridging of those uh, actual pipes or wires or what have you that are going through the walls when you're getting down to the minutia of making a really high performance home. Yeah, it seems like wires are easier, right? I mean, because they're small and uh, it seems like tape would work uh, well enough to air seal, you know, a Romex cable poking through the sheathing layer. Uh, but I think when you're talking about these bigger penetrations, uh, you know, electrical boxes for light fixtures and outdoor outlets and uh, even bigger uh, holes like your dryer, your range hood, your ERV. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's more problematic, but maybe that's just my imagination. 
What do you think about detailing the exterior, Mike? I'm, I'm sure people get that wrong even more often than the uh, air sealing uh, aspects of big penetrations. Do you think that HVAC techs and folks who are installing ERVs are paying attention to flashing these big penetrations that are going through the building envelope? You know, I've um, talked to a couple of building investigators who go out and look at where the problems are with buildings with on the water management side. And they say, the first thing they say is, don't let the your, your trade contractor partners who are making those holes in the walls do the flashing. You need a flashing specialist um, mm. to do the flashings, um, whether it's integrating with your water resistive barrier or if you're using a sheathing integrated water resistive barrier, um, using the right tapes and, and, and layering if you need to layer. And then as it penetrates through your exterior siding, you want a good siding contractor to do that connection, you know, make it look good. But it's that underneath at the water resistive barrier, you want to have a flashing specialist take care of that. Boy, I didn't know I'd need one of those on my list of subcontracted trades. Uh, but of course, it makes sense, right, to have the flashing specialist uh, given the risk with rotten, moldy buildings. Well, you know, if you were starting in business today, maybe you wouldn't become an editor. You become a flashing specialist. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would get me on some kind of list I don't want to be on. <laughs> yeah. You can have your T-shirt made up, flashing specialist. <laughs> Yeah, I was, uh, you know, I've always had better success when you tell folks uh, where they should be making holes and make blocks for them and make provisions. If you're expecting to get to the end of the build and have folks to be able to do a good job, and the, and the important phrase there is be able to do a good job, you need to plan for that and flash those penetrations. It can't be just someone drilling with a hole saw at the end of the build and expect that to be a durable, uh, well-flashed uh yeah, because that can be a big air leak and a big water leak, and then you got big problems after you know if that's not taken care of. Yeah, and you know, oftentimes that stuff takes a long time to show up. I think you'd agree. So that you have a really big problem by the time someone notices. Exactly. Well, I want to thank all of you for your questions and feedback for the show, and uh, I want to thank Mike, Brian, and Andres for joining me today. And I want to remind you all to send your questions, comments, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at findhomebuilding.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Thank you very much for listening.